Hey there, everybody, and welcome back. I am really excited about our conversation today because um, actually teaching history is one of my very favorite things. I love the conversations that always come around uh, our history classes. This has been a a subject that when they were younger, we were always able to do together. Um, but today we're actually going to be talking primarily about an older approach to teaching history and how important it really is um, to, to make sure that our children and actually us too, because we all know we learn as much as they do, um, but all of us are really grounded in what actually happened and we, we take the time to evaluate those things. So I want you to join with me in welcoming Ben Kunkel with the Ashbrook Center and he's going to talk to us today a little bit about um, just going to source documents as you're teaching history and why that's important and how you can do it and um, this is this is a very exciting conversation. So whether you have littles or bigs, uh, stay with us because I think that you're going to learn a lot um, and we'll also be talking about some great ideas for those of you with littles along the way. So uh, Ben, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Leslie. Appreciate it. Well, you are very welcome. Can you give me just, a, or give us, uh, just a little bit of your background and kind of what is the philosophy of the Ashbrook Center? Why does it exist? Um, and, and, you know, then we'll jump into the, the what's and, and the wherefores, but give me a little bit of the why first. Yeah, sure. Uh, I've been with the Ashbrook Center for about 17 years now. Um, and what the Ashbrook Center is, is an independent center at Ashland University that really focuses on trying to improve civic education in America, uh, specifically at the, at the high school level. Um, and we do that through encouraging teachers uh, in public and private schools and homeschools, obviously, uh, to use primary source documents. Um, so what that means is that we really don't uh, encourage the use of textbooks. Um, we really try to get students to and teachers to use uh, so, so say you're studying the Declaration of Independence, let's read the Declaration of Independence and try to understand it the way the authors understood it and go through it and try to, to really get to the meaning of what they were, they were getting at as opposed to using someone else's interpretation. Uh, because whenever you use someone else's interpretation, there's going to be some opinion built into that. And we think it's better for the students to come to their own conclusions. Uh, it, it improves their thinking. It helps them develop critical thinking skills that are so important in so many aspects of, of not just history and government, but life in general. Uh, and using that gives them a, a less biased view of history as well. And, and usually it's a lot less boring for them too. Uh, too often textbooks just take what I consider to be the most interesting stories in, and uh, that they can come across in many cases and, and make them actually kind of boring and dry by, by simplifying them and taking maybe some of the interesting bits out in order to uh, just sort of, you know, explain it, dumb it down for them, I guess you'd say. So that's the approach we use and we think it's a much better approach for most students and we think that it's a much more interesting approach for them too. Hmm. So you noted that I, uh, you know, your, your goal is to just improve civic literacy and history literacy and, so, and stuff like that. The, I, I want you to talk about the resources that you guys offer, but also address whether, you know, in, in our state, which we homeschool in South Carolina, um, in high school, you have to have U.S. history and you have to have government and economics. So those elements are required for graduation. Um, so, you know, kind of how does this fit into those elements? Because I imagine that's pretty standard across most of the states. Um, but, but the resources that you offer, which guys, they're amazing. You're definitely going to want to check it out. I'll leave you a link down below. But if, if you can talk about those and, um, you know, just what, what boxes do they check just from a, a legal standpoint, but also, you know, like you, you alluded to, it's, it's through studying the stories, it's through studying the people and, and what led them to write the way they did and that kind of thing that just makes history so relevant. It, it's not sterile anymore. It's actually real and tangible and, um, and fun and exciting. So uh, just kind of walk us through some of your resources and, and how we can utilize them in our homeschools, please. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, the most useful thing, I suppose, probably is we have a free high school curriculum that we, we offer. Uh, there's no strings attached here. This is really just free. We, we have a, a lot of donors who give money to the center and, and help in, in the hopes that we will 
get the word out on this stuff. So, so we really are just offering this free to people. It's a, a PDF download. And the curriculum is nine units long. Each month we consider to be about a unit's worth of work. And each unit covers one major document. Uh, the first of being the Declaration of Independence. We move on to the Virginia Statute of uh, uh, Statute for Religious Freedom. Uh, along the way, we catch up with the, the Gettysburg Address, and and we end up at uh, Martin Luther King's "I Have a Dream" speech. Hmm. Um, and so each month, we cover one of those documents. We have several documents that support those. Uh, so. There's like for using the example of the Declaration of Independence, one thing we have students look at are some of the letters that Thomas Jefferson wrote to uh, some of his friends later on in life where he reflects on the meaning of the Declaration of Independence and what it has meant to not just America, but the world in terms of spreading democracy and things like that. So it's interesting to get his perspective on what he thinks it has meant to the world. And that's something that I think a lot of people don't look at. Um, and it's, it's really useful in understanding his mind on the subject. So we try to get relevant documents like that that tie back into the main document and help us give it, get a better understanding of it. What? And then along with each of those documents, we have a paragraph at the beginning, which gives you some historical context so students understand why they're reading that, what it means, and sort of what, what's going on in the world at that time. And then a few guiding questions for them, too, so that they understand a little bit what they're looking for as they read it and what questions they should be trying to answer as they think through the, the, the material. Hmm. And then each unit has a few assessment options as well. So... Um, we try to give parents a few choices for how they can assess their students. And we also have a, a, an answer key too, because we realize that not all of you out there are historical experts, <laughs> myself included. Um, so it give you some idea of what a good paper or a good uh, speech or something would look like. We do try to give at least one non-written option for the assess assessments on each unit so that uh, if you have a student who is not great with writing papers, they have some oral options as well. Fantastic. Um, so that's the main thing we have. But then alongside that, we also hold monthly webinars for the students. And they, each month we cover the, the main document for the unit that's up that month. And these are free and open to the public. Again, uh, if you sign up for them, students can come and join us. We have students from all over the country that join in. And one of the professors here at Ashland University will lead, just lead a conversation about the, that document and try to help students understand it better. Um, everything we do is very conversational, so it's not a lecture from the professor, but it's really just a lot of give and take between the students and the professor, um, him posing questions to them and them coming up with answers, and sometimes they ask him questions as well and try to, to just get a better understanding of the material and, and help them work through it as they get their, uh, get the unit worked on. So, so I think that's really good. It's, it's certainly not required. If, if people can't make the webinars, that's no problem but we do offer that as a service uh, to anyone who's interested if they want to get a little bit better grounding in, in material. That's uh, that really, I wanted to stop there for just a second because, you know, as someone who's homeschooling, well, I only have two in high school right now because I just graduated one last year, but knowing that on it, knowing that there are resources out there that can, can really assist not only in kind of the accountability of, you know, are they able to discuss this and, and that kind of thing, but also just in giving them a deeper look at things than I would necessarily feel qualified to do. Um, that's a very exciting prospect. So those webinars are something that um, I just, I think are a really great thing that you offer. Uh, plus it's, a, it's teaching our, our teenagers how to interact um, through web, through a platform like that, which I think will help them long term as well, because you know we all know that the world is um, going a lot, even upper higher education. There's a lot of digital elements to it, so um, right. I, I appreciate that you all throw that in. Now, are those all live? So um, it's it's literally that one for that month, no matter where you are in your in in within the curriculum in your family. Uh, is that the way they are, or are they pre-recorded and you can pick up one whenever? No, they're live. They are okay. live, and and they get to talk to the the, the professors directly. Uh, it's, I think it's a good opportunity for them also to see a little bit what a college class would be like too. So many of them are, of course, getting close to that point where they need to pick a college and they're thinking about college, and it gives them a, a little bit of an idea of what a college classroom is like because the the professors really don't 
try to simplify this any more than they would for their own college level students when they talk to these kids. So, um, you know, it's, it's, they challenge them and they, they really try to get them to work through the material. And some of this is hard stuff. I mean, we've been arguing about what the constitution means for 200 years. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's not just uh, easy to, to figure out what all the answers are sometimes. And so, so I think that gives them a little bit of a preview too of what college will be like. Yeah. So with that said, would would your curriculum largely um, kind of skew to the older uh, end of high school, the juniors and seniors, or is this something that uh, they would be able to handle throughout high school? The reason I ask, I did a terrible thing to my older son, my oldest son, <laughs> and signed him up for a U.S. history class via an online provider when he was a freshman. So this poor 14-year-old boy um, was stuck in an AP class that was actually for juniors and seniors. And he was, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was a terrible thing. And I've apologized multiple times. Um, but what I actually did, it ties into you guys because um, he, he made it through the class, but he didn't make it through with shining colors. It was a real struggle for him because he just wasn't mature enough to handle it yet. He didn't have the skill set to handle the, the amount of work or the writing or anything else. Yeah. Um, so at the end of that class, I had him finish it, but I actually took your core documents, uh, your 50 core American documents book, and we worked through that at the tail end of it to give him more grades to try to bring up what he had done uh, with that very, very difficult class. So um, I, I am kind of under the assumption this is probably an older class based on my experience. Yeah, we do think this is probably mostly for junior, senior level high school students. Um, of course, everyone's st students are different. And if you have a particularly advanced one in terms of their reading comprehension and their analytical skills, I, I think it may be possible for you to do it with younger kids. But but I, uh, we really aimed it towards a upper level high school, like you say. Right, right. Um, so just, just to clarify, because I'm not sure if we've answered this or not, would this, would would this approach be primarily a U.S. history credit or a government credit, or could it be either? I think it could be either. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is, it's probably a little more historical in the sense that it's, it's not so much getting into the nuts and bolts of government, uh, like a lot of government classes do, where you're talking about, you know, how many senators does each state get, and, and how, you know, what's the electoral college, how does it work, and, and, and sort of, you know, detailed questions about how our government works that, that a lot of government classes would get into. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you're looking for that sort of thing, you're probably not going to find it here exactly. But, you know, the way we approach history and government ties those two things together a lot. Uh, we think that it's very difficult to study history without understanding politics and vice versa. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of overlap there, and that's sort of intentional on our part. So, I mean, I think, you know, depending on how you want to structure your own home school curriculum, I think it could work for either, uh, but it probably does skew a little towards the history side. Okay. All right. That's what I assumed, and that's how I have used it historically, um, but I thought it was worth worth asking the question anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, I, and again, I mean, that's one of the beauties of homeschool is that you can make those decisions for yourself, and, and so I think that, you know, depending on what your focus is, it could work for either. Now I want to I want to back up just a little bit here. Um, my children, thankfully, really truly love history. Now they they enjoy studying it. Uh, they were kind of baptized into it. Their daddy has um, a master's in history from Georgia State, so you know he's he's <laughs> been very focused on making sure that they do. So we've done a lot of things through the years, but. And I think that that really helps them in these upper level classes. You know, Peyton uh, just came to me, he's my second son, just came to me yesterday to talk through something that he had read in his history class. Um, and he's doing it largely on his own now because he's a junior in high school. Um, but how can we, those, those who have younger students, what are some ways that they can really start whetting their appetite for a love of studying history, studying these people, learning what happened and why, how that all you know works together to get us to where we are now, because we don't live in a vacuum. Everything that's happening now, obviously, is a is a result of things that have happened before. Um, so, what are some ways that you would say uh, are are good ways to encourage a love of studying history while our children are younger, so that they have a great appetite for these deeper classes when they're when they're older? 
Yeah, no, that's a great question. And, and I think that, you know, the, the most important thing with history is to make sure that you teach it in such a way that it stays exciting and interesting. Because to me, what, what always kept my interest in history when I was younger was that it was just such interesting stories. Mm-hmm. And, and so, I mean, I, I know as a kid, one of the things I liked to do a lot was to read biographies of some of the important historical figures from the past. And so, I mean, a really good biography can can tell some of those interesting stories and in a way that feels to the student much like a good book, you know, a literature book would. Um, But for them to have that added knowledge that this stuff actually happened sometimes makes it even more exciting. So, and another way to reinforce that that actually happened is to take some of your kids to historical sites and let them see some of these places that they're reading about in books. Um, You know, you can't go see, uh, the places in fantasy novels and things like that, you know, we can't, we can't all go see, uh, you know, the, the places in Lord of the Rings and that sort of thing, but you can go see uh, George Washington's estate and you can go see the Capitol building and you can see where Abraham Lincoln was born and things like that. So, so I think, it, you know, if, to the extent that you can uh, for family vacations and things like that, take them to some of these places and help them understand that all of this really happened. And these, these great figures that they read about in their books were real men who, who did real things. And, and so, you know, I think that helps reinforce to them the, some of the exciting things that happen in history. Um, and, and, and like I said, just keep it interesting because the, to me, the biggest crime that you can commit in, in terms of history teaching is to make it boring. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and again, I, I hate to beat up on textbooks all the time. Well, I don't hate to, I guess, but I do. <laughs> um, is that the textbooks just make it so dry um, that you find too often, I think, that students start dreading having to do history work, when to me, it seems like it should be one of the more interesting things they do. Uh, so, so I think those are some ways that you can get younger students involved. And, and once they have that, that love of history and everything, then they're going to want to dig deeper into it later on. And they're going to be excited to, to not just learn about Abraham Lincoln, but sort of read his words and and start thinking, you know, through some of the problems that he had to deal with on, on, and try to understand from his perspective, why he did some of the things he did and why some of the things he did were so amazing and so forth. So. Hmm. Yeah. I, um, I, I want to encourage all of you listening, especially those that have younger children. Um, one of the things that is such a blessing about homeschooling is we have the flexibility to teach our children in very unique ways. And, So if we take advantage of the historic sites around us, of even as we travel, you know, our children have been incredibly blessed to see historic sites actually all over the world because God has opened doors for us to take mission trips and that kind of thing. Um, And it just, it changes everything when you are in Copernicus's house, which we actually got to visit. All of a sudden, all the work that he did, you see, first of all, is way more varied than what you learn in a textbook because he had a body of work that was crazy impressive. Um, but, but beyond that, he is all of a sudden a very real person who had a house, who had you know, a, a neighborhood and all of that. And so giving context to these people, to George Washington, like Ben said, to, um, to these other play, people where you can visit places they actually were, visit battlefields, all of these things, it it really gives a very personal element to these things that they're studying. And it, it instills in your children a desire to learn more because we are just by nature interested in people. Um, and so I would, I would echo his, uh, his sentiment there that, you know, take as many field trips, teach through experience that way while they're young so that they will just be hungry to dig in and learn. Um, Because I think that you'll find the conversations that you have, not only when they're younger, but as they get older, surrounding these things will be, just give you great opportunities for parenting, for discipleship, for teaching, and all all other ways. Um, So, Ben, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I am going to link to a a lot of your resources and stuff so that I make sure that people can find the Ashbrook Center and know what you have to offer. But is there anything just imparting that you'd like to make sure that they know uh, that they can take advantage of? You guys are so gracious to offer all of these resources the way that you do. Just a couple other things. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we do have a series of books that we have. Uh, you already referred once to the 50 Core American Documents book, and, and that is sort of the, the, the primary book in that series that we use. Uh, and, and these books have essentially a, a collection of, of 
primary source documents that you can refer back to. And, and so in this era of, of uh, all these lists that you find on the internet all the time, top 10 of this, top 10 that, mm -hmm. we decided to put together some books that have uh, sort of essentially lists of, of, of uh, primary source documents and then include the document in there too. So, so we have the 50 core American documents book and then we're doing a lot of uh, collections for different eras and different subject matters. So we've got about another seven or eight of those completed now from things like the Constitutional Convention, World War II, the Cold War, uh, religion in American history. Uh, so many different topics like that. And we're going to be producing quite a few more in the next few years. So um, we've got those available for students and, and you can buy those on Amazon or you can buy those through our website. And then also I wanted to mention too, we have a, a summer academy uh, for high school students that we have every, every year. Uh, it's a week long, uh, we kind of like to refer to it as, as history camp for, or, or summer camp for history nerds, sorry. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's a lot of fun. They get to interact with the professors and we have basically a week full of classes just like this, the webinars that we do. Um, so if you have a student who's particularly interested in history, it's a really good experience for them. It is on our campus here in Ohio, and it's one of the few things we do actually charge for. It's $750 for the week, but they get two college credits for having participated. Wow. Uh, that includes everything, you know, their, their food, their, they get a couple t-shirts, uh, they get some books. So it, it's a really good experience, and, and if they're at all thinking about uh, college, I think it's also a good exposure to what a college classroom will be like for them too. So it's, it's a lot of fun. And if you have a student who's interested in that sort of thing, uh, have them look it up. It, basically, it's designed for students between their sophomore and junior years and junior and senior years. Okay. All right. So I will give you guys a link to that as well, because that, um, that sounds like something that would be incredibly valuable. Um, it, it's so good to give your children as many different experiences and, and as many different tools for the future as you possibly can. Um, so Ben, again, thank you so much for joining me. This has been um, a lot of fun to talk through. And uh, so I, uh, I appreciate your time. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. Uh-huh. All right. And the rest of you, we will be back next week. So stay tuned. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed this video, you've got to check out Teach Them Diligently 365. Every week, there are even more thorough videos and chats about things that are interesting to you year-round.